Hello and welcome back. Today we're going to take a little bit of a break from engine development and actually build a game because believe it or not we have everything we need to make something. Um, now if we just run what we have right now in Hippo Editor, here we've got the ability to render a rect with shaders, we have inputs like the mouse and the keyboard, um, and that's pretty much all you really need to make something. Uh, so I'm thinking Pong because that'll be pretty straightforward. And it'll give us a good idea of sort of what's still missing, what else we can work on in the engine. There's some obvious ones like textures and whatnot, but with shaders we can do a lot. So the first thing we're going to do is open up our premake5.lua because right now the editor itself doesn't really do anything for us in terms of making games. Um, so what we're going to do is just create a new project. So I'm just going to copy the hippo editor project in its entirety. And then just paste it here with a different name like Pong, maybe V1. V1. And that's actually all we need to do. Uh, everything else will stay the same, just like the editor. So let's save that. And we'll open CLI.bat so we can call Genesilen. And that's done. So switching back, we can reload and we should have a new project ready for us to start using. And here it is. So I'll go show all files. And then the first thing I'll do is actually have to create a folder called source because our premake 5 defines that everything will be built from the source file or from the source folder. And now we can create our main, which I'll call pong.cpp. And I guess uh, one of the things we could have done in the premake 5lua is set this as our startup project. Um, so when we click play, it'll run this. Uh, I'll just do it from here. And we are ready to start. We need a hippo engine and a hippo main. And then we'll have a class, we'll call it Pong V1, is a public Hippo app. And then we'll have that Hippo app star uh, create app, return new Pong V1. That should be all we need to get started. Um, so let's just run it and make sure we're good. I think that's... Okay, NSDL2 is not there, so let's fix that. We'll just get it from Hippo Editor. We should have it. And we'll just drop it here. We will come up with a better way to do this in the future uh, with our tool chain, but for now, we'll just leave it like this. Now you can see we run a full screen app that uh, we can't close because it's full screen, but that's fine. Let's uh, close this. And the first thing we'll do is we'll override that window properties function. So hippo core, and actually before we start writing a bunch of stuff, let me just, using namespace hippo, uh, that's better. And now we'll have a core uh, window properties, get window properties. So props dot width equals I think we're doing 800 by 600 height equals 600 that's probably all I care about for now now we'll have a void initialize void shutdown and we should actually tag these as override some compilers care some don't uh, we should just do it because it's the right thing to do <laughs> void update and void render Actually, we'll do a void iron GUI render as well. And now that we've got this, let's sort of plan out what we want to build here. So I'm imagining an app where you've got sort of a paddle on each side and then a ball. And the ball will just sort of move in an angle, bounce off the bottom, and only bounce off the sides if it collides with the, with the paddle. That's pretty straightforward, and then if it goes out of bounds in this direction, it's a point for the left paddle, and if it goes out of bounds in this direction, it's a point for the right paddle. So we'll have a point system, maybe uh, sort of first to five wins, and then when the ball goes out, we'll want to reset its position and potentially its velocity. I think I guess if left scored, um, the ball should go towards the right. Yeah, because if left scored, it's the other, it's the opposing side's turn to return the ball so I think that makes sense 
Um, and then for the background, maybe we'll have like, again, we don't have textures or anything, so we can just leverage a shader to make it look interesting. Um, it could be like a space theme with like stars going by or like just like a, a, a fancy animation. We'll take a look probably through Shader Toy and find something that's interesting. But the way I'm thinking about this stuff is the paddle. So the paddle will need a way to move. So maybe a keyboard input for like what up is and what down is. And then we'll have two paddles, right? And the paddles will have a position and that's probably it. Um, and then the ball itself is going to be the same thing as a paddle, except it'll also have a velocity. So maybe we'll have like a game object class that paddle inherits from, and we'll have a ball as well. Uh, actually, paddle, we might not even need a paddle class. Like these could just be game objects, and then the ball could just be ball, so it has an additional velocity. I think that makes sense. So let's just switch over to the code and start sort of ironing these things out. So the first thing I want to do is create a folder here. We'll call it um, maybe game objects, and then we'll have a game objects .h and a game object .cpp. So we'll have a class game object. It's public, private. Um, and I guess game objects will need a way to render themselves. Uh, we obviously don't have an entity sort of system or an entity component system yet, so uh, everything will have to sort of be class-based, um, which means we'll need hippo graphics mesh .h and the shader. And for the position, we'll need GLM. And uh, these are gonna be shared pointers, right? Because we have to pass them in as shared pointers to the render pipeline, so let's include memory. And I will have a std shared pointer to a hippo graphics mesh called a mesh. And do the same thing called m shader for a shader. I will have a glm vec2 uh, pause, I guess, and pause. And I will need a size as well. So switching back here for a second, um, our. We don't have a camera, so we have no way of modifying the coordinate system of our screen, which means our screen is uh, this point here, the bottom left point is negative one, negative one, top right is one, one, and so that means that our sort of width is two across from negative one to one, and our height is two as well, which means the size of these paddles is gonna have to be something like very small, right? Like 0 0.5, 0 0.1 maybe or something. Uh, 0.5 would be a quarter of the screen, so maybe maybe less, maybe 0.25 or 0.3. We can play around with that size, but we're going to need to track a size anyways because we want to be able to resize these things. Same with the ball. So let's do a GLM vec2 and size. I think that's all we need. So uh, maybe when we create a game object, we'll pass in the things it needs. So we'll pass in a sh the shared pointer to hippo graphics mesh. Mesh, same thing with the shared pointer to a hippo graphics Oops. shader, shader, and maybe even the position as well. Uh, const glm vec2 reference pause and the size const glm vec2 reference size. So m mesh is mesh. Shader, shader. Okay, good. And now, obviously, as we're sort of going through our game loop, we need to be able to update the position of these things, right? So we'll need a set pause or even like a move function. So let's do a void set pause. We can pass in a const glm back to reference pause and pause equals pause. That's to move it. We shouldn't have to scale it unless we do something like power ups and stuff like that, but. Let's keep it simple for now. But also maybe a move function where it takes the GLM vec2 reference by. So you're moving by this amount and we'll just say m plus plus equals by. That'll allow us to move the paddle without having to get the position, make a modification and then set the position. Um, speaking of get the position, we'll need that as well. So const GLM vec2 reference, get pause, const turn pause, and size as well. Oops, and size as well. Size. 
And now the only thing that's missing here is how to actually render a game object. Um, so we'll need each class to handle its own rendering. So we'll have a void update and a void render. I'm not sure that we'll do anything in the update, but we'll have it anyways. And then switching over, let's include game object dot h void game object update void game object render. Now for the render piece, uh, we're going to need our hippo engine to be able to render it. And if you remember how we transformed the rect on the hippo editor side, we're going to do the same thing here. So we'll need a glm map 4 model matrix equals glm map 4 identity. And then we'll say model equals, and actually we'll need um, external glm gtc matrix underscore transform dot hpp. That's what allows us to say things like, oh, sorry, gtc. It'll allow us to say things like glm translate, and we'll translate the model matrix by mpause, and then model equals glm scale, the model matrix by m size. And of course, we're storing this as vec2s, but it wants vec3, so we can actually just say mpause.x, mpause.y, and then 1.f. Actually, we want to translate by 0.f. And then for size, we'll do m size.x, m size.y, and then we'll scale by 1.f so we don't. There we go. And now we haven't defined our shaders yet, but I'm just going to basically take what we have from Hippo Editor. So I know it's going to be a model matrix, and I know it's going to be called model. So I'm shader, that shader is set uniform, mat4, uh, model, and model. And now that we've got this, we can just say Hippo engine instance get render manager dot submit and they'll say uh, we have a helper right hippo underscore submit rc and it'll be a render mesh with a mesh and a shader there we go that's it for the render again i don't yeah we don't really need anything in the update so I'll just get rid of that thing and this thing will have to render itself which is no problem it will say um update is empty and then any subclass can override it and I think that's good for game objects. So now we can sort of start making or creating game objects here um, to store the left and the right paddle. So let's go ahead and include uh, game objects slash game object dot h and memory as well. And now we can own a std shared pointer to a game object. We'll call it um, left paddle and M right paddle. And let's just sort of initialize them and just so we can start seeing things. So I think it was in my main that I had this stuff. So I want this back. Oh, I don't really wanna, I don't really wanna get this all cluttered up. Maybe we'll have like a, let's just have like a, a factory header that can just sort of create these for us. Since paddle is going to be the same thing twice, and um, yeah, in source, let's just create a factory.h, which can create these for us. Um, and if we put it behind the namespace, we can start, we can keep these things here as static, right? So static float vertices, static 32 square t elements, because these are going to be reused for everything. All of our meshes will be this. And then the meshes will have to just create sort of below, and actually we'll need memory for that. And we'll need basically the same stuff that game object.h needs, these two. Yeah, and this could sort of be our reusable shader for everything, and then we'll sort of create these things in helper methods. And these will be static as well. Maybe we'll say capitalize these just because they're globals. Vertex shader, fragment shader. And now we can start defining these sorts of helper methods. So I still shared pointer to a game object we'll call create paddle. And it should just have to take in like the position because this will define its size and everything, right? So const. GLM vec2 reference pause 
and it doesn't know what a game object is. Okay, and so really we're just gonna make. Actually, we had this over here. We're just gonna do this and the other one. So that's the mesh, and this is the shader. Right? It'll be the shared pointer to a uh, graphics mesh. So this would be a shader, and you want to opt into it if you want. So I'll just do it this way. Good, and these are capitalized, so vertices, vertex shader, fragment shader, and elements. Okay, this will just rename these so that they're not, look, they don't look like number variables. And I guess the, our color, uh, I guess we can touch these up a little bit because we don't actually want everything that's happening here that we did before, so we don't need a color being passed in for now. Uh, we'll just have like an auto rat equals uh, stood make shared game object and we'll pass in what do we need a mesh a shader a position which will be the positive passed in and a size let's just pass in something called size and we'll define it here glm back to size and we can just um, I don't know let's say 0 0.3.1 maybe to start or wait that's width the height let's do 0 0.1 0 0.3 and then we can return ret. So that should work. Now all we want is to sort of touch these up. So let's see, we're taking in a vec3 position. That's correct because that's what this is. Um, we don't need to output ourselves as pause, right? We just, and we don't even want an offset. We just want uniform model matrix. So we can, we don't need this anymore. Model times vec4 position one. Yes, good. And then here we'll just have the out color. And let's just say, um, everything will just be, white right like let's just make it white for now yeah that should be good okay so now back in maybe i'll just uh, close all but this just so we can start fresh uh, pong here okay so now we have a left paddle and right paddle and then in, in the initialize we'll just want to say we'll have to include factory and we'll just say and left paddle equals uh, factory create paddle and the left paddle will be at position um, zero point, actually negative one point F and zero point F. So negative one is the left side of the screen, zero is the middle. And then the right paddle will be the same, but it'll be at one point F, zero. Okay, and then in the update, uh, these don't have to be updated, but just in case we decide to add something, let's just call its update method on it. So left paddle, right paddle, update. And the same for render. I think that's all we need. So let's just try this. Error, this must return, oops, yep. Yeah. Return props. Okay, we have nothing being rendered. Um, I thought this should be enough because we have our look at window.cpp it's getting rendered like it's doing all the work here oh yes of course it's rendering to a frame buffer that we <laughs> actually we, we used to be able to render to the screen now we actually have no way of rendering to the screen because we're rendering to an off-screen buffer and only window knows what that is right um but we expose it so actually we did this in main.cpp we're actually, the only way we can render the game is by rendering this game view with this image from the window. So we'll actually have to take this and use it here. So that's already a good point in terms of what our engine can do. Right now it can't render to the screen. <laughs> so maybe I'll keep a note of that. Let's see. So to do, add ability to render game to screen. And this really would just mean render the hippo window frame buffer to screen from hippo window. So maybe we can have like a flag that we can set on the window to determine, to tell it whether it should be rendering to the screen at all or not. Um, but for now, we actually do have to rely on IM GUI, so uh, we'll have to include that. And 
the window is uh, yeah that should be fine oh yeah it's frame buffer it doesn't know what frame buffer is I think so yeah there we go and the size sure let's just leave it as is let's run it and just make sure that we are at least rendering two paddles oh yeah okay nice there we are so we have this and that is the size of our screen and there are two paddles um, so we can't move them yet but we have all the functions that we need to be able to support that um, so maybe we'll just let's make the game view a little bigger so this can be let's see we're 800 by 600 so let's make it um, I guess 750 by let's say 450 let's see what that looks like because I know that we need some extra space for the for the top here yeah we can go a little a little longer let's say 550 That's too much now. Actually, is it? Do we make it? Oh yeah, we do just make it. Nice. Okay, this this is good. So I'm not. I mean, it's not great that we have to render to I am GUI, but it's there. It's functional. So now we'll have to define sort of how to move each paddle. Um, I don't really. I guess I can just have ints here, right? So int and left paddle up, and left paddle down, and right paddle up, and right paddle. Down. I'll have to include hippo input keyboard, and then in, in the initialize we can set those up, right? So m left paddle up equals um, what is it? Hippo input key underscore. Um, let's say for the left paddle we'll use w, and for down we'll use s, and for the right paddle. Let's just do this. We'll use up for the arrow keys and down arrow key. Okay, so we'll call update on them uh, and then we'll handle their movement. So if hippo, actually input keyboard um, key and left paddle up. So if it's being held down, we should move it up by some amount, right? So and left paddle um, dash arrow move and we can say move by passing the x will move by zero and the y will move by some negative m paddle speed that we'll have to define as well float and paddle speed and again we don't have delta time or fixed updates so this will have to actually vary from computer to computer <laughs> but that's fine um, let's do it here and paddle speed equals, I don't know, 0. Uh, let's try 0. 0.1 f. That might even be too fast, but we'll, we'll give that a shot. Um, so let's say up and down from the left paddle, and then we'll see what that looks like. Move by positive. Okay, we'll run it. And here we go. Okay, that's actually not too bad. And it's backwards. Why is it backwards? W. Oh yeah, up is positive, yeah. Negative one, negative one is bottom left. So there we go. So now we're moving a paddle. Um, we should move the other paddle as well with um, right. right. So now I should be able to move both paddles with WS and up down. Perfect. Uh, now we are going off screen, so we'll need to sort of clamp its position if it goes too far. Um, we can do that at the end, so... Actually, I guess we can just do it here. Like, if you're holding down the key, and M left paddle, I sure get pause dot Y. We can only move up if it's less than um, 1, which is the top half, minus M left paddle, that should get size dot y divided by two because let me just visualize this real quick. So if this is the top of the screen and this is the paddle, we only want to allow moving up. This is the pause. So x and y are here and we have the size, size y. So we can only move up if the position is at, and this is positive one. So if the position is at one, which will bring it here, minus half of the size right so only by this amount so if the position is here that's 
when we're allowed to move up. So we'll check if the position is less than one minus the size divided by two. Yep, that makes sense. It's not the prettiest. We can pull these out into other variables and yeah, why don't we just do that? Let's say a float m left half size or maybe m left max y equals um, this, the left paddle, not the left paddle, so I position. The max will just be this. One minus the left paddle size divided by two. And the min y will be negative one plus because we're going up now. So negative one plus the size divided by two. So that's for the left paddle. And we'll say, let's actually just keep it all here at the same place so it's conceptually makes sense. And the right, it'll be the same, but I'm doing it this way because if we add a way to like increase your size, I want this to be updated to match. Um, so now we'll just say if the left pause is less than the, the max here. So M left max Y. We can move up and then we can only move down if the key is pressed and the Y is greater than the min. Yeah, that makes sense. And so here we'll do right paddle Y, right max uh, Y. And the right paddle Y is greater than right min Y. Okay, I think that makes sense. Let's try it. So here I'm pressing W. Yep, I'm done. I'm pressing S and that's perfect. And then the right paddle does the same thing. That's awesome. Okay, so now we have the ability to stay within bounds, um, which is great. We just need a ball to play with. So let's add a ball. I think we'll just have, um, yeah, our game object, like our paddles don't have velocities. They don't need velocities because we don't need that level of uh, distinction there but our ball will. So why don't we just add a ball header, which is, uh, we'll include um, game object. Uh, this ball is a public um, game object. And the game object's uh, constructor takes in everything it needs. We're gonna need the same thing, but also defining a velocity. So we'll have, oops, there we go. So we'll take in a mesh, a shader, a pause, a size, and a velocity. Const glm vec2 reference um, val. Okay, and then instead of just setting these things, we'll just call the game object constructor with the mesh, shader, pause, and size. And then we will initialize our glm vec2 um, val here. And val is val. Or maybe we just initialize the velocity to zero. Um, and don't even do this, right? Like, I think we do this because then, like, we'll need a way to set the velocity anyways because we're going to reset the ball and stuff. And maybe we don't want the ball to start right away with the velocity. So, yeah, let's let's do this. And we'll just have a method for it. So, void set velocity. And then, do we need to get the velocity? Probably not, we'll add it if we need it, but what I do want, because it's gonna bounce off the walls, I wanna help a method for that. So flip val x, uh, and we'll just say mvel dot x times equals negative one, and flip val y, mvel dot y times equals negative one. And then we wanna reset its position, which game object supports. So I think this is all we need, really. Um, render will work, update will work, even though it doesn't do anything. So I think this is fine. Let's go to our factory and have a make ball or create ball with a position as well. And this will return a shared pointer to a ball. I want you to know what that is. And the size of the ball, let's just make it 0.1.1. Okay, let's try that. So our pong.cpp will now also have a shared pointer to a ball and ball. Actually, yeah, our factory is already including the game objects for us, so we don't need to include them ourselves here. Um, so let's just do this. 
ball equals factory create ball. And we need a position, so let's say 0.f, 0.f to so start it right in the middle, and then we'll update the ball. And for now, we just won't move it. Let's just leave it like that. We should, oh, we're not rendering it. Oops. So we might have a ball, we just don't see it. So let's say and ball, make sure render. This will make sure the ball is always rendered above the paddles. And nice, there's our ball. It's, uh, I guess our, our view is a little stretched, so that's what 1-1 one, one looks like. And you, you fix this with the camera to make sure that everything you know, is, is, looks correct. But right now, because we're negative 1 to 1, regardless of the size, it is going to get stretched. So maybe we'll just fix that. I don't want to like force the the game view to be smaller, so we can just fix that on the ball side. We'll just make it 0.75, maybe. Whoops. I'm at 0 0.075. Yeah, that's better. Nice. Now the ball's a square. We can fix that. Um, we don't, again, have a way to load a texture, but we do have shaders. So why don't we say um, we'll have a fragment shader and then we'll have a, a ball fragment shader. And what it will do is um, we'll use the ball fragment shader here. And then we'll just discard any pixel that's outside of sort of the center. Now, in order to know that, we do need to know the position that's coming out. So I wonder if I can expose the position. So like an out vec3 pause. And I wonder if this cares if it's not pulling it in. Because here we'll say in vec3 pause. And now what that looks like, um, if this is the rect that the fragment shader is rendering to, it only knows each fragment that it's rendering to, right? So we talked about this in the rendering video and how it will interpolate between. So if it, if I pass in that position, let's say it goes from uh, negative 0 0.075 to 0 0.075 or whatever, whatever that range is, um, by passing that in from vertex to fragment, this fragment will know that it's somewhere in between. It will linearly interpolate between the two to arrive at some value. That will allow us to test distance to the center. And what it should be able to do is just get the distance of these two points, and if it's greater than some threshold, discard discard that fragment, which means it won't render to it. So we'll take a fully rendered rect, and we'll just test for distance. Uh, the distance would be the radius that we'd want. And any, any fragment outside of that will get discarded, and any fragment inside of that will get rendered to our, with our color. So I can say if... Um, pause.x actually uh, x and y don't don't really help us here we can actually use a method called length a function called length that glsl provides and it will give you the length of a given vector so because we know zero zero is our center because our rect is defined that way where left side is negative right side is positive so zero zero is right in the middle we can just check the length of pause this value that's getting passed in and if it's further away then um, we're going from negative five to five so if it's greater than 5, the length is greater than 0 0.5, and we know it's further than our radius, and then we can discard it. And discard will actually end the function. It won't, it won't actually set a color because you're discarding that fragment, and it'll just skip the rest. So we'll do this, and then we'll just set the out color here. And that should actually be all we need, and we are using that fragment, so let's try that. Okay, we got an error. Let's see. GL invalid value. Um, shader link error. Okay, so there was a linker error in our shader, but it didn't give us what the error was. Probably it's this that we're, we're outputting and we're not inputting here. So we could take it in and do nothing with it, right? In vec2 pause. Or the alternative is we could have a separate vertex shader for the ball, which is probably better or more correct. But let me just make sure that that was the cause and actually that's a problem because I'm mismatching the types. This is a vec3, <laughs> even here. Okay, hold on, let me take a step back. Maybe that was the error. Out vec3, pause. That's better, it's not working because I'm never setting it. So in here, I'll have to say pause equals position. There we go. There we go, that worked.
So now we have a little ball. That's all done with the shader. That's perfect. Um, and now with the ball, we can start moving it based on its velocity. So maybe in update, and we'll do it out here instead of like in the ball class, just because here's where we have access to everything else. Maybe not the best way to set it up, but I don't really think we even need an update method. But once we've done all this, we'll move the ball. So m ball dash arrow move m ball dash arrow get vel. Oh, do we not have a get velocity? We don't have a get velocity. So const uh, glm effect two reference get vel. Turn on val. Okay, that's better. So get val. Okay, so that'll move based on its velocity, and let's give it an initial velocity, set velocity. Um, let's just move it to the right, so we'll pass in a 1.f, 1.f. Okay, let's try that. Now it should move up. Okay, it's gone. That might be too fast. Actually, we have a ball velocity? No, we don't. So let's make it um, 0 0.01. There we go. Okay, the ball is moving. That's awesome. So now we should probably just test for the sort of boundary uh, out of bounds and bounce off the top and then go out of bounds for the right and left side. So why don't we just here, after we move it, we'll check if we're, if we're sort of out of bounds on the vertical. And if we are, we'll just flip that Y velocity. So we can just check if M ball, that share will get pause dot Y plus half of the size again. So plus, um, all right, we can actually just do the same thing we did here. So put it down here for the ball, there we go. So we'll have it right here and we'll just say M ball, max Y, min Y will be, max will be one minus M ball fit size and M ball fit size. Now we'll move it and then, so we'll say if Y greater than or equal to M ball max Y um, or M ball dash arrow get pause dot y is less than or equal to m ball min y so if we've gone out of bounds up or down then m ball dash arrow uh, flip val y that should do it now it is going to go out of bounds left and right so why don't we just give it a velocity of zero let's just make it really small so we should be bouncing up and down yeah nice yeah that's perfect okay so it's bouncing on the vertical. Now we'll just need it to bounce on the horizontal if it's colliding. Now for collisions, this will be pretty straightforward. What we can do is just a simple AABB bounce check. So the ball, even though it's a circle, it's still represented by a rect with a position and a size. And our paddles are also rects with a position and a size. So in order to check if two unrotated rects have collided, um, we can, there's a very simple sort of algorithm where you check if the left of the ball is to the left of the right, and if the right of the ball is to the right of the left. So for example, here, you say, is the ball's left edge less than the paddle's right, and is the ball's right edge greater than the paddle's left? And you do the same for the top, and that'll work for sort of any location. That, that's always going to be true if there is a collision. So why don't we just write a quick helper method to check sort of collisions between rects and we can use it. So we can just do that here. Um, that could very well be an engine level thing, um, but the point here is not to do any engine work. Um, we can actually, let's just track that separately. So to add simple rect collision, and then maybe even add separating axis theorem collision. That's for rotating rectangles. We actually went over this in my older series about let's make a game where we made a game like Flappy Bird. Um, so I actually went through that explanation so we could bring that over to the engine as well. But for now, let's just have a very simple helper method here in this class. So down here, maybe we'll just have our privates. Actually, I don't need that if I'm doing this all online, <laughs> private. And then we'll have a void um, or a bool um, is colliding. Maybe we'll pass in, so we have a position and a size for two things, right? So const glm vec2 reference uh, pos a, cos glm vec2 reference size a, and then the same thing for b.
So given a pause and a size, you can determine the left and the right side, and we are assuming that the position is in the middle and the size is sort of centered across uh, width and height. So similar to what we did up here, we can do something sort of the exact same, but we'll just do, um, so this will be M left, so oh, sorry, M A left, which will be pause A dot X minus size A dot X divided by two. Right, so pause A is the middle minus half of the width will give you the left position. We'll do the same for float A right, which will be pause A.x plus that. And then up and down. So we'll say MA top and bot. And this will be Y minus and then Y. And then if we're going up, we're actually adding. And if we're going down, we're subtracting because it's flipped for OpenGL. And we'll do the same for B. do this so it's easier to read also easier to blanket modify okay so now we have all the sides for each shape so we can just return and then we're going to return a couple of checks here right so we said if the left so m a left is less than m b right and m a right is greater than m b left and then we'll do the same for the top and bottom so m a top is now in this case greater than m b bottom and m a bottom is less than m b top and that should do it for us and maybe to test this we can just very quickly do something here let's make the ball not move at all just turn off its velocity and let's just make it so that I can move a paddle um, left and right. Because what I want to do is just bring it over in a controlled fashion and just verify that it's all working. So let's say if we're doing a hippo um, uh, input key A will be for left, um, which will be negative paddle speed 0.f. And we'll do the same for right, so right will be D, and we'll move it in the positive X. This this will go away, I just want to confirm that we can collide with the ball, and then we'll just say hippo trace um, collision, and we'll output um, is colliding, and then we'll have M ball get pause, M ball get size, M left paddle get pause, M left paddle get size. One more. And we don't have log. Okay, let's give that a shot. Oh. So it thinks it's always colliding. So let's just make sure we did this correctly. So MA left. Oh, uh, silly. I used A. I only meant to change the bottom ones. Okay, let's try that now. Okay, so false, let's go into its space. There's a true, uh, there's a true, there's a true, and there's a true. Okay, so that is working as expected, which is awesome because now we can very easily check for collisions when the ball's moving. So this will be the vertical, and then for the horizontal, we'll just say um, if M um, is colliding, M ball, that arrow, get pause, and ball actually we can reuse the same thing we just had because this is going to be for the left um, and we can just say an or is colliding with the right paddle then we can say and ball dash arrow flip vel X. And this should actually be enough for us to have a working game that will not be able to reset itself if we let the ball go out of bounds on the left or right. But let's give it a shot. I'm on the ready. 
Okay, that was too fast. And actually, I don't know if you saw that, but it, it bounced. I sort of came into it while it was going out of bounds. It bounced fo like back, and then it bounced back again. Um, that's actually a very common problem. Basically, if we have the paddle here and the ball here, and we then on the next frame, maybe, the ball is here, it's going to say, okay, I'm colliding with the right paddle, so let's flip the velocity in this direction. And then on the next frame, it'll be maybe here, and it says, I'm colliding with the paddle, let's flip the velocity in this direction. So it'll actually keep doing this until it reaches the end of the paddle, and then it'll either go this way or this way, depending on the last collision. So we can fix this in two ways. We can have a timer that says once we've collided, we don't collide anymore for a short amount of time. Um, but right now we don't have, a, the engine doesn't provide a way to do anything with time. So that's something else we'll want. Three, um, uh, proper delta time fixed update and even just a timer slash stopwatch functionality so that'll be good to have so for now what we can do is have like just a bool um, m collision or m ball collision uh, left let's say equals false so i basically want this bool to flip every time it bounces left or right so if the ball is going to start going to the right we'll actually want to set the true so we only want it to flip if I'm colliding with the left paddle and M ball collision left is false or I'm colliding with the right paddle and M ball collision left is true. Oops, is that, is that, there we go. So that should do it. And now what I'll do is I'll just print trace M ball collision left just so we can see what that's doing but really it should just I'm gonna hold up again oh, I missed it but M call collision is true which means it will only ever collide with the right paddle and then once I've collided I should actually reset M ball collision left to flip it um, now let's just slow down the ball a little bit just so I can actually reach it um, there we go oh that's too slow i mean that's fine i'll leave it for now but see it's true so it will collide with my right paddle and there it bounced perfectly now it's false so now it's on the ready to collide with this paddle and what you'll see is if i approach the ball sort of from the side and reach it once it's sort of past me it will only collide once with the left paddle like this see before that would have done that sort of left and right zigzag bounce thing but now we've got something that's actually functional here. We've got a ball moving around, bouncing off our paddles. It's very slow. And I think maybe the ball should speed up as it bounces. And like if I'm going, if I'm moving along with the ball, I should actually add more speed to it. And if I'm moving against the grain, I should reduce the speed maybe. Like that. But yeah, we're almost there. We just need a sort of score tracking, um, make the ball speed up a little more and have a way to end the game. So maybe I'll start with the ball speed. So up here, we have the paddle speed. Yeah, and we said we wouldn't do this, but M ball speed uh, doesn't hurt to have because we're gonna need to reset this anyways um, after it goes out of bounds, right? So a ball speed, let's say it's, uh, if this is the speed, let's say M ball speed equals 0, 0.0. That's a little slow, let's make it 0.05f and then here we'll have ball speed ball speed let's give that a shot oh wait did I miss a factor of 10 it's a little better oh yeah and I should probably get rid of this because we know that's working now and then I guess if the ball goes out of bounds, we should like reset the state of the game. So maybe we'll have a reset function as well. Or we can reset the ball speed back to this. So yeah, maybe we'll uh, put these. Yeah, let's put these down in the reset function so that we can only have to set them in one place and we'll call reset from initialize. And then same with the set velocity, we'll call it reset. And then we'll reset the ball position as well. 
and maybe the paddles will reset them to the center as well. So I'm paddle, left paddle, pause, and what pause did we give it? Um, yeah, these. good so now if we detect that the ball is out of bounds which we know can only happen on the left and right side so we can just say um, if I'm ball I should get pause I have the min x yeah that's fine get pause dot x let's just do it uh, in line here so minus and ball I should get size dot x divided by 2 so if the x minus the half of the width is less than negative one. Um, and I guess I can do that. Or the ball's x plus half its width is greater than one. Then we know we've the ball has gone out of bounds. So well, actually, we should decide it goes off of. We'll determine who scored. So let's actually go ahead and have an int m left score equals zero. Int m right score equals zero. And I'm not being really consistent here with which values I, s I set. But I guess these are the ones that will actually like persist across points, whereas the others won't. So I think this is fine. Um, so left score, right score, maybe an int m points to win equals 5. And so then if the ball goes out of bounds, left side then the right paddle score so m right score plus plus and then if i guess we'll check for the um m points to win later let's just get the score working so m left score plus plus here and then we'll reset okay and maybe if i make the window a little taller we can now also uh print out the score here in, a, in its own window so begin score or let's say info then we can have um, I'm GUI text and the format it takes a format it's just like a printf so we'll say uh, left score uh, percent D left score and then we'll have right score and right score so I think that's probably enough and I just increased the, the height of the oh oh I didn't call in child my bad there we go so now I should be able to set this and yeah you can see the score is actually working perfectly so left score is left to scoring and if I go up and actually block the ball and go off the other side right is scoring and yeah everybody gets reset oh ooh there's a bug. Okay, so reset will also have to reset this. This actually is not pers like for the whole session. So we'll want to say m ball collision left equals true. And actually it will only be true if um, left scored, right? If left scored, then right receives. So I need to know who scored. Um, this is passing a bool. It's not the greatest, it's actually kind of gross, but um, so if left score is true, then end ball collision left is true, so this will be equal to left score, and that should do it. Uh, reset doesn't take zero arguments, yeah, this is also true to start. Yeah, that's not great, but hey, we're just trying to get something working, right? Okay, so left is scoring, that's working. Oh. Wait, did I do it backwards? If left scores, then we want to... Yeah, I thought this is right. What, did I do it wrong here? Um, oh yeah, I did it backwards. If it goes off the left, then this means the right. Yeah, I have it right here. I'm just not really paying attention. Alright, let's try that. 
So their left scored. I will now properly bounce. And let's just confirm it. I can bounce again. I'll let this one score. And yeah, now, yeah, yeah, okay, so at that point, the ball should be going the opposite direction. So the velocity of the ball, when we reset, actually the matter is based on this. So m ball speed equals that, and then set val, this will be this, times, and then left score. If left scored, then we want the velocity to go to the right, which is positive, else negative one. So we'll flip the ball speed on the x to negative if right scored. Okay. Let me just break point that. I'm not sure what, what's going on there. So ball speed is that. And then times. Oh, uh, this is probably doing some multiplication before the ternary here. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so left scored, I bounced properly, right scored, now it goes to the left, yeah, that's perfect. This whole left scored, right scored thing is kind of gross. A timer would have been much easier, like we said earlier, where like, you just can't collide with a paddle for a certain amount of time after having already collided with a paddle. Um, we could even just say, like, don't collide with the paddle until you cross the middle again. That actually probably would have been simpler. Then we wouldn't have to keep track of this weird bull flag. But this is working. So now I think the next thing I want is to have the paddles um, speed up the ball when it bounces off of them. Or, like, I guess only speed up the ball if I am, like, going with the grain. So here the ball is moving up. So if I hit it while I'm also moving up, I should give it more speed. Uh, whereas if I if I hit it against its velocity, like if I go, if the ball is going down, here the ball is going up, so I'm going to go down, that should slow down the ball. And I mean, I know Pong, I think usually it's like where on the paddle you hit the ball, that's going to determine like its angle of refraction or something, but um, we'll just keep it simple here. If I'm going with the ball's velocity, um, I'll just add some multiplier. Um, but yeah, this is, this is coming along. So we'll need to know what multiplier we want to use for that. So let's say float and ball mult. And I guess this is something that will sort of can always be the same value. Let's just say 1.1. So if I go with the ball, actually let's say 0 0.1. So if I go with the ball, I'll give it this plus one. So I'll give it 10% of additional speed. And if I go against the ball, I'll give it 0.9, so 1 minus this, which will decrease it by 10%. And the way we can do that is pretty straightforward, because here, I guess I have to know now who I'm colliding with, which is fine, we can do that. So this is if I'm colliding with the left pedal, so I'll still want to do this. But I also want to check now, so if... Um, and we have the left left paddle up and down. So if m ball get val dot y is greater than zero, that means I'm moving up. And input keyboard get key uh, key, and it'll be uh, m left paddle up. So if the ball is moving up and the key to move the left paddle up is pressed. Then we'll say m ball dash arrow get val. Can I set? I can set val. I can't like bump it up, so I'll just say set val. Um, and I'll pass in m ball dash arrow get val times one plus m. What do I call it? Ball molt. Yeah. And then else if. The velocity is less than zero, which means I'm moving down, and I'm holding down. Actually, either of these, yeah, either of these should increase the velocity, and I'll just do the reverse. This is going to be an else. I'll do the reverse if if the ball is going up and I'm holding down. 
or here I'm going up. Then I'll set the velocity to itself with 1 minus 0.1, which means it'll go down 10% instead of up 10%. Um, that's pretty straightforward. I should now, ugh, I'm not a fan of having to, all this copy paste code. I could even just have a function that takes these two in. That'll save us from having to repeat this code. So yeah, let's do that just because it'll be cleaner. We'll just say, um, maybe here, um, void handle paddle collision. And we'll pass in an int for uh, up key and an int for down key. And then we can do this exact same test, but this time instead of m paddle up, it'll be up key and here it'll be down key. I think that makes sense. So now up here, all we have to do is call, instead of doing all this, we just call handle paddle collision and we'll say m left paddle up and left paddle down. And now here we'll do the same with the right. Okay, and then maybe just to be safe, let's also print out um, here in the info. Let's also say I'm doing, um, yeah, we'll say text as well. We'll say ball val is percent 0.2f, comma percent 0.2f, and ball dash arrow get val dot x, and ball dash arrow get val dot y. So that way we can see if that's actually going up and down. What am I truncating here? Oh, silly. Okay, so ball velocity is zero, that's wrong. Negative zero. Oh, it's, uh, the velocity itself is actually gonna be very small, isn't it? What do we give it? Um, yeah, so I can't use <laughs> 0.2f, um, but I can multiply it or I'll just use 0.5. There we go. Okay, so if I bounce, so here I wasn't moving, so it's not increasing or decreasing the velocity at all. It's still at 5. But here I'm going to go up with it. And there's there it is, 55. And I'll go down with it at 6. Up with it. I guess it's always 10% of whatever the current value. Okay. Yeah, that kind of worked. So now it's a little wrong because even if I'm holding... If I'm up against the wall and I'm holding up, it's still going to count. But I don't think that I don't care enough about that. That's fine. And now you can see the ball is speeding up. That's awesome. And now let's slow it down. Backwards. Yeah, that went down. That went down. Yeah. So you could actually make it go really annoyingly slow. But yeah, it's up to the players to decide if they want to do that. Okay. Awesome. This is coming together. So I think the only thing I need to do now is... Um, I guess reset the game and like, yeah, reset the game when somebody wins, right? And like tell you who won. Awesome. And I, I keep hitting escape. I want to use escape to quit the game. So let's do that as well. And update just real quick. If escape we'll just quit and return we don't need to do anything else because it won't matter and then yeah so I want to check scores so at the bottom here once everything's done or I guess I could do it inside of these ifs yeah let's do it inside of these ifs so maybe I'll have a bool so we can have some sort of game state here like bool um, m in gameplay equals true we'll start with actually let's start at false equals false so is gameplay only matters or uh, any of this processing only matters if m is gameplay or in gameplay. Yeah. So we only update things if we're in gameplay. And now, if we can have, um, let's have another window which we can dock on the right side, which will be like um, menu. And here we'll just have a if I am doing button um, start game then m in gameplay is true. And this will only happen if m in gameplay is false. 
So if we're not in gameplay, give me a button that says that sets us in gameplay, and then once we're in gameplay, the next loop we won't render this button again. Um, and then I guess once there's a winner, we could have a split string and winner text is empty to start. And then once we score, if m right score is greater than or equal to m points to win, then m winner text can be right paddle wins. And then m in game play equals false, right? Which will set us back out of that state. And then we'll do the same for this one. If the left score is greater than points to win, then left paddle wins, m in game plays false. And so then if we are in I'm GUI render, if we're not in gameplay, we'll give you a button and we'll say I'm GUI text and we have m winner to um, actually format will be percent s and we'll have m winner text dot cster. There we go. So when we start a game, we don't do much processing, so we can keep it here. We could have a start game function as well to do stuff for us, but we want to set this to true and set m winner text to empty. I think that covers us. So if I start, everything should be where it is. Okay, perfect. Let me move this. I'll dock it. Oh, I don't have docking enabled. Let's enable docking. Down here. And maybe we'll also have a back panel to dock everything to so that it's nice. And what was that again? It's iron GUI colon colon doc space over viewports and we pass in iron GUI get main viewport. Yeah. And now we can dock this in the main area. I guess it kind of left the lines it, but that, that's fine. We could even increase the this a little bit. But then I want info down here. And I want the menu, maybe to the left. Or to the right, yeah, to the left makes more sense, I think. Okay, so you can see the game is sort of paused. Um, this is now a little too tall, just to barely, like, we still see everything is just triggering the, the bar there. Um, maybe we'll even just push the, the image over a little bit. We should do that. But if I hit start game, now the game has started and we are playing. And so I'll let the right side win. Two, three, four, five. There we go. Right paddle wins. The game resets and waits for us to hit start game again, which will start the game. That's perfect. Oh, uh, did we not reset the score? We did not reset the score. So reset. Should say in left score equals zero. And right score equals zero. And then we can just uh, push it over a little bit. So it's I'm GUI set cursor pause, I think. Yeah, set cursor pause. I guess we could just set the X. And I just want to basically move the cursor over by, let's say, 15 to start. I don't know if that's enough, but we'll give that a shot. I guess you know, I could very easily calculate this, so uh, my width, my window width is 800, my screen, or my image width is 750, so I should push it by 25. See, math does help sometimes. That should be perfectly centered now, yeah. Yeah, there we go. This looks like we're pretty much done here. Start game. Speed up the ball a little bit. Maybe a ball valve should not be being shown right now, but... It's fine for this, and uh, yeah, we have a two-player Pong game. Now the background is a little boring. Oh man, that's fast. That's awesome. Oh, what happened to the score? Oh, silly. I reset here. I shouldn't reset there. I should reset on start game. This is where now like a function really to start the game should be used because we're starting to do a lot of stuff in there, so start game, we'll just set these things, and then reset will set these things. Because this reset is reset per round, basically, and start game is the whole game. So, final test here. We have one, there we go. There it is, left paddle wins. Score is 5-1, I'll start the game, and now the score is 0-0. 
perfect. Okay, let's spice up the background and I think we're done with this game. So I found this on Shader Toy. If you don't know about Shader Toy, it's a really cool website where you can sort of play around with shaders and sort of teach yourself how to do things. There's a lot of really great um, sort of things that other people have done here, like this. It's just next level shader work. Wow, this looks amazing. Planet. All of this is do done with shaders, uh, specifically with fragment shaders. So if you ever are interested in seeing how people do things, you can actually look at the code for all of these. So um, anyway, Shader Toy is great. But I found this, which is supposed to be the background for Fall Guys. Um, so I will just throw this in the game. So I'm just going to copy all of this. And then to make a background, we'll just need another game object. Um, so maybe we'll have the factory return uh, use the share pointer to a game object. Create background or BG. Doesn't need a position or anything, uh, but this will be our shader. Um, so maybe I'll just have it here as another thing. Static cost char star BG frag mint shader. There we go. And now I'll need to modify it to actually work with GLSL. I guess these were these were always a little further ahead. There we go. And then this one, this back one, and I'll need this line. Okay. And uh, yeah, I guess really I should just take this. I should copy this and then take this piece and put it in our main method because it really that's what it's going to do. Our main function. I keep calling functions methods. Um, this is good. Okay. Um, so yeah, our main uh, will return an out color. So I'll say out color equals vec4 call 1.0. And let's see what they're doing. So they're taking, um, they're just defining some scales. I don't need that here. Defining some colors. And then they're taking the length of um, frag cord. Okay, so this like sort of uh, divided by the resolution sort of thing is what ensures that it ensures that this is a perfect circle, regardless of sort of the width and height of the screen, right? Um, you can see obviously it's more wider than it is tall. Um, so it's actually not, without this, and actually I should be able to show this, if I don't divide by this, um, it should be warped. Oh, well, that's very warped. But the point is like, it, it stretches more on the X than it does on the Y because the X is wider. Um, so you can see, anyways, they're using that uh, that actually doesn't really matter for us because our coordinate system is from negative one to one in both axes. So really what I'll do here is just say maybe the length of frag coord, really. And in this case, frag coord is exactly what we're doing for the ball shader. Um, it's it's this, the, the position of the fragment. So if I, yeah, I am already taking it in. So instead of frag coord, I can just do pause. What else do I need to change here? Uh, oh, eye time. So um, Shader Toy has something called eye time, which is just a flow representing the amount of time that has passed since the start, and that's what gives you that animation. And you can see they're using sine, sine waves here to do that. Uh, oh, I already have something called pause, and it's getting used. So maybe we'll call this um, V pause for vertex pause. So I'll have to fix that everywhere um, that it's being used. Okay. Uh, but yeah, now uh, this it needs an eye time, so we can pass it as a uniform. Close eye time. Zero point f. Zero point zero. Now for us, obviously, like I said, we don't have eye time. We don't have the ability to ask for the time or how much time has passed or a delta time. So we'll have to just use like a frame count and just use that instead, um, which is fine. It'll it'll sort of help. Uh, simulate time and then it looks like everything else you're doing here is all within the parameters they've defined so um, this actually should be good to go uh, we'll continue using the vertex shader that we're using for everything so here let's just do this mesh is the same thing the shader we'll use the vertex shader and the bg fragment shader oh what did i call it yeah a fragment Fragment shader. Yep. And then the size, because we're going from negative 0.5 to 0.5 and we want to go from negative 1 to 1, I'll just say the size is uh, scaled by 2.f in both directions. And the 
pause. We're gonna make a we're making a game object on a ball. Oops. With a mesh shader, and the pause will be um, uh, zero zero because it will be centered on the screen. I'll draw in here. Oh, I might, I might not be able to do this for for make share. So we'll do a GLM vector two. There. Or I'll just sort of do what I was doing before, and I'll just have a GLM vector two here. Pause. Shift my depth. Shift my depth. Okay, that actually should be all we need. So let's just go back to pong.cpp. Let's add a stud shared pointer game object called mbg. We'll set mbg equals factory create bg. We don't have to, oh, we will have to update it here actually because um, iTime will need to get set on the shader. Ooh, so I time so uh, background will actually need something in the update method, but I don't really want to create a class just for that. So why don't we just say any game object will have update where we'll set that I time so M shader dash arrow. Uh, we can have a static int frames equals zero. M shader dash arrow set uniform float uh, I time will be frames, um, let's just say time 0.01f, I guess. See what that looks like, that might be too fast, too slow, I'm not sure. So I'll just add it into real quick so we don't have to store anything locally, and it'll just be within the scope of this function. And yeah, every game object will do this, so any game object could have a shader that is animated in some way. Frames plus plus. Let's see what that looks like. Oh, I'm not rendering it. And there was an error compiling the shader. So what was the error here? Undefined variable pause vertex shader line eight. Okay. Sorry, vertex shader line eight. Yep, repause equals position. Let's try that. Oh, again, I'm not rendering my background. Um, so I won't be able to tell if iTime is doing anything. So let's go back to Pong. And we are updating. So that'll set to iTime. And now, oh, sorry, hold on. We're not updating MVG. There we go. And uh, maybe the background should update regardless of whether we're in gameplay, right? And then we'll render um, bg l render. Now let's give this a shot. There we go. There's some animation happening. That is really weird looking with the white game objects. Um, let's go back to factory. Let's make them black. Point f. Uh, okay, so now we'll need a vec3. 0 point f or 0, 0 0.0 and then comma 1.0 because we'll still want the alpha to be 1 that's easier on the eyes start game there it is oh i i time moves faster when the game started um plugs were taking There's your fancy background. Oh, I think this makes it look worse. Let's be honest. The like simple cornflower blue background was a little better with the white paddle and ball. But hey, now we got a fancy shader as a background. You can do a lot without textures, eh? Oh, it's getting fast. That's it. I lost. Okay, I think uh, I think we did it. We built Pong. We have game state. We have fancy backgrounds with shaders, um, all within a separate project that is using our hippo library to actually run itself so this is pretty great this is a good achievement i think we got a good list of things to work on uh i didn't add textures did i <laughs> i should add textures let's do textures too because that'll be uh, texture support because te textures will probably be coming up soon because i want to do like sprite sheet animations and that sort of thing um but look like we spent a little over an hour, I think, working on this, and a lot of it was just polish at the end, and we did it. So thank you for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed this little side video where it's really just let's see where the engine's at. Um, I plan to do these sort of a couple more times sort of as checkpoints as we go through just to make sure that we reassess where the engine is and, and figure out some, some things that we can build. 
uh, for the engine. So that's it for today. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.